Hello gardeners everywhere, especially the mid-American gardeners, because that's what you're watching. And we're glad that you've tuned in because we are going to talk about plants and maybe critters and maybe fruits and vegetables, whatever comes up, we are happy to do it. And we're glad you've joined us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. But I have three really talented people here with me. We're gonna find out who they are and their expertise. So if you're calling in, you can direct your question in that vein. And I'm gonna start first with Jim Schuster. Hi, Jim. Hi, I'm a retired extension specialist in uh, horticulture and plant pathology. And what I have today are things that people have done in their plants, some on purpose and some by accident. <laughs> but this is, you know, people have tied their plants to help hold them in place and then forget to untie them. And these things uh, help strangle the plants. And this one, they used the branch of a tree as a clothesline, forgot to untie it once in a while. And everything from here on out and all these places, uh, even string will kill your plants. And then a few things that were by accident, they were using a wiffle ball and they lost it in the shrub and didn't find it until winter when the leaves fell off. Oh, and that, wow. that doesn't it's come. Stuck on. Oh, yeah, it's stuck on. And then back in the 70s, uh, they used to uh, braid weeping figs, uh, house plants. And in the Chicago area, they used to put little plastic footballs in it and charge an extra 20 bucks for that plant. And now, and this one was on purpose. Everything else was by accident. So there's or, string, or, clothesline, wire. Yeah. And what have you got there? This is a nail with and that's uh, a nail. wire. Uh, on it. This oh, was wow. put in through the plant to keep people from cutting through the hedge, mm -hmm. and just high enough to uh, trip them. And so yeah. it, it mm -hmm. cut it cut the hedge. Right. <laughs> is what it did. That's right. Well, that's really kind of fun in a sad sort of weird pruning oh, way. Yeah, and I have a whole bunch more Do of these. Do you really? Okay. No, well, every so often you've got to bring those because that is fascinating. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go next to Sandy Mason. Hi there, Sandy. Hi. Hi. I'm Sandy Mason. I'm with the University of Illinois Extension. I'm horticulture educator for Champaign, Fort Iroquois, and Vermilion counties here in East Central Illinois. And I handle just about anything green and growing. So whatever yes. these guys don't want to talk about, I guess I'll talk about. So That's we'll, a we'll fair deal. There. Uh, and I actually have a question from a viewer. Um, where uh, uh, they say that their peony just refuses to bloom. And uh, they actually sent in a picture of it, so we get uh, kind of an idea of what the plant looks like. And just sort of looking at this plant, we don't have really any information as far as how old it is, but just looking at the picture, it looks like this is a pretty small plant. So, and again, we don't really know whether this was a division, so really kind of wonder if maybe this was a newer division, or maybe it was just maybe one on sale, a little discount <laughs> there. So I think peonies are just one of those. They really need some time, and they need some maturity uh, to really bloom well. So I just have a feeling maybe this one just needs a little bit more time, a little maturity, uh, and have it get a little bit bigger. So that might be part of it. Now, if it actually is, seems like it's actually setting blooms or buds, but then they're not opening, then that might be an issue where we're actually getting a disease problem, which is sure, some, Jim could talk mm -hmm. about disease issues on peonies, but if you're not seeing any buds at all, it's either maybe lack of sun or maybe just a really young plant and just needs some maturity would be my thoughts. And while we're talking about peonies, Peonies, now that they have flowered, the ones that did flower, I need to get those cut off. It's time. I, I was it? just thinking, I've got to get, I'll see you just a moment. Let me go get those. <laughs> anyway, a little deadheading. Yeah, a little deadheading. It's really good on peonies to do that. So yeah, I need right, to do that. Right. So right. hopefully it's just too soon yeah. for this peony. And the sun would be the other issue. Typically, mm -hmm. we'd really want these to be in, in pretty much in full sun, you know, good drainage, those kind of things. So I would look at those things, but then just wonder if maybe it just really needs some time. Okay. Well, that was a good question, but it's to be determined on some of it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sandy. And then we're going to go next to Dr. Phil Nixon. Hi, Phil. Hi. I'm an extension entomologist, which means I do bugs. So you're totally right. If it's green, uh, Sandy gets it. If it's chomped, <laughs> I get it. If it's dying, it's Jim gets it. Oh, so, wow, what a uh, day. You know, we're, Jim and I get interested in stuff that tend to keep plants from growing and looking nice. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I've got a viewer email on, says, I believe I have cutworms that are eating my hostas. What do you recommend that I use to prevent more damage? Um, none of us have ever seen cutworms do any damage to hosta. Uh, the, uh, so I really doubt that that's what's happening, although it could be. There are two kinds of cutworms that will, will occur. Some are called climbing cutworms, and they'll climb up uh, ceilings of trees and so on. 
and eat the edges of the leaves away. Um, and then there are others that will wrap around the stem, uh, very small stem plants like your tomatoes and eat them off. And anything make that stem wider, such as a nail next to it or putting a collar around it so the cutworm can't get to it, uh, will, will protect those. Probably hostas are too big for that to happen. Generally what we see in hostas is, are, is slug damage. Slug damage will show up as holes in the center of a leaf. Any caterpillar is going to eat from the edge in for the most part. So uh, if what they're seeing are holes in the center, it's probably hostas. It's probably hostas. It's cutworms. If it, I mean slugs. Slugs and hostas go together. You don't have one without the other hardly. Uh, and slugs build up in dead organic matter, lots of moisture. So reducing the mulch, spacing the plants apart. So you have to go in there and pull weeds will eliminate most of your slug problems. Uh, you can also put out slug baits. Uh, Sluggo is a good product, has iron phosphide in it, which is not going to be a problem to dogs getting into it and getting poisoned like some of the other slug baits are concerned. But generally we try to increase the amount of, of uh, air movement, reduce the amount of moisture. That's real nasty on slugs and then your house to look a lot better, but you do have to usually go ahead and weed them because you don't have the mulch and they're too, not that close together. And, and I will say slugs, I think slugs have been terrible this year, at least in, because we had all that moisture mm -hmm. uh, that early on and just continued. I've seen slug damage on all kinds really? of things, even in my strawberries, you know, actually feeding on the fruit. I just seen a lot. So I think that's probably, I mean, absolutely, it seems like and that would be it's really nice if you go sense. out early in the morning when it's sunny. You can see silver yeah. strands oh. of slime trails <laughs> in glistening in the sun. It is so beautiful. It's <laughs> great. Oh, my. <laughs> Oh, if you are a bug <laughs> dude, Phil, Phil thinks the insects are beautiful. I think diseases are yes. nice. Yes, <laughs> I'm so glad there are two of us sick. to help alleviate this issue they've got, the Sandy. Sickness. So here we go. We well, it. we're moving from glistening slug trails. We're going to go to the video mail next. So let's see what we've got for that. Hi, I have a question about this Green Beauty boxwood. Uh, I just purchased five of them, and when I got them home, I noticed a very faint uh, white kind of dust or powder on some of the leaves. And before I go to the trouble of planting these, I wanted to try to find out if I should be concerned about this as a possible uh, blight or powdery mildew, or if it really is just dust. Any ideas? Thanks. Okay, hmm. that was a nice video. Right. We thought that plant looked really nice. <laughs> right. So, but anyway, what, what, what do we have for this okay, Well, the dust would come off with uh, just wiping, uh, swiping of your finger or a cloth. Very easy to come off. Powdery mildew, though, is embedded and has to be rubbed fairly vigorously to get it off. And I've never seen powdery mildew on a boxwood, so I don't think it's that either. And they really looked pretty darn healthy. They did. I mean, the plant did. And probably the one thing that I know is too. Sometimes in garden centers and stuff, that they, they they do overhead irrigation, and sometimes the water's from wells or whatever. And so you get this kind of calcium to kind of deposits and stuff. So sometimes mm -hmm. just from the garden centers, you actually see this kind of you know almost dusty looking stuff, and it's really just calcium deposits and stuff from the water that they've used. And usually it rubs off pretty well too. So it too it might be that as well. So. It's probably that, but if you look real, real close, boxwoods are covered with little white spots on the, on the leaves. And so if you're like me and always carrying a hand lens around, you look too close, <laughs> you'll see those things. And of course, they won't rub off, but they're not on the up surface anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Sandy's answer is right. I've seen that before where the lime left behind or the calcium will they get, make things look a little dusty from a red watery. So we say in mass to go ahead and plant those <laughs> because it. that <laughs> those really look nice You're gonna but go thank a long you way to find that good ones that yeah was. that does look good so thank yeah. you for your video we appreciate it well let's go to the phone lines next and we'll start with line two and it's about blueberries hello there line two are you there line two yeah. what's your question i about three or four weeks ago i think it was phil nixon said something about uh Aluminum sulfate or ammonium sulfate for blueberries. David one Robson would last week. One wouldn't. Yeah, David Robson was talking about it. And oh, I'm sorry. And also, Doctor. Which Scurvy. one is it that I should apply or shouldn't apply? For blueberries, it's actually ammonium sulfate. Ammonium. Yeah, because 
Yeah, because aluminum sulfate is really something you should reserve for your hydrangeas. Because at yes, high, and yeah, because at that's high why, levels, why do all these uh, catalog companies push the aluminum sulfate for blueberries? And it was actually on the packet from a garden center. Mm. They actually pushed it for blueberries. I noticed that, too. I don't know. From from everything that I've been told, and even in, I think, in the small fruit um, book Absolutely. from the U of I, it says not to use aluminum sulfate. Because actually aluminum at, at even you know fairly low levels, but high enough levels, that it can be toxic to some plants. And evidently, blue, it, blueberries, it can be. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether they're just getting that L stuck in there, and it should be ammonium and not alu you know aluminum. I don't well, know. Back when I used to do a lot of soil testing, uh, we were asking some of the people why uh, aluminum sulfate was, and it was because it was so abundant. You know, the, the sulfur was coming from the refineries from when they did process the oil on the west coast, and aluminum is one of the more common minerals they can mine, and it was so easy to put them together. So it's more available, mm -hmm. and they want to sell right. more yep. product. Right. Hmm. So remember, it's ammonium for blueberries, ammonium sulfate for blueberries. Thank you for asking that because it really is important to get the right one. All right, we thank you, and then we're going to go on to line three, and it's about an apple tree. Hello there. Yes, hello. How are you? Great. Good. I bought an apple tree, and I planted it, and there, was, there weren't any leaves on it, and it came out, and then all of a sudden it disappeared, and it um, came back out, its leaves again, and now it disappeared, and I'm figuring it deer is eating up the leaves. Um, could you have a possible suggestion what I might get to prevent this? Uh, it's unusual that anything would happen that way. Did, they, did the leaves dry up and turn brown first, or did they just... No, they just disappeared. Just disappeared. Well, you could mm -hmm. have uh, canker worms on the plant. Uh, uh, it's probably going... Or you could also be getting uh, uh, may beetles that would have been on it. It's a little too late for may beetles now, but it could have been earlier when you had them come out. Um, I would try uh, uh, spraying the plant or dusting the plant with carboyl soda 7 if it's a caterpillar or a beetle. Uh, the beetles will feed at night so you don't necessarily see them. That might be an option for it and I've always heard that plants have three sets of leaves so you're down to your last <laughs> set. Uh, wow. so, uh, so you better make sure it works this time but uh, but yeah I would I would try uh, just as a preventative maybe using using seven on it because you are down to probably your last strike with that plant. Now, you, you, he also said it was a new tree. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, my question is, has, uh, how long did it take them to disappear? If it went real quickly, I suspect they're insects, but if it took them a week or so to disappear, the apples they may, no, drought stress. Drought stress. Uh, there are high winds, and I've seen in my own neighborhood a bunch of new trees that within a week they were all dehydrated mm -hmm. and dead with the high winds and they weren't protected well enough. So it could be a combination of all of the right. above. So if they're in an exposed location, you might want to put some sort of a screen up uh, from the southwest uh, where you're mm -hmm. going to get your strongest wind and, uh, and see if that doesn't, doesn't help a little bit, uh, uh, you know, paneling or, uh, or, uh, or a couple of stakes with burlap between them. Anything to break the wind a little bit might mm -hmm. help on that s score if they're very exposed to the wind. Okay, well, we're going to move on to uh, from an apple tree to an insect, and let's go to line four. Hi there. <coughs> Hello. My question is directed to the entomologist, Phil Nixon. My question is, right now, this time of year, there's a small biting insect, very tiny. Um, it's prevalent all through the country areas, and it uh, uh, bites, and it's very tiny. Could Phil Nixon please just me what this insect is? Uh, what we've been having for the last couple of weeks and probably still is occurring yet are buffalo gnats, also known as black flies, uh, which can be out. They're going to be more heavily in Illinois over in the uh, around in the Springfield area and also down to the southwest down towards uh, towards Belleville area, that sort of thing. Uh, they are associated with our water getting cleaner and uh, so the larvae can live in there. They're filter feeders. We get them in East Central Illinois too, but they've kind of passed here. They've been on and, and are mostly gone by now. Uh, but uh, 
about all you can do is, is use insect repellent. It works for many people, containing DEET, uh, cutters are off. Uh, some people will find good luck with, uh, with vanilla extract uh, rubbed onto the skin. Others find that they bite more when you do that. Oh. Uh, for a good gardener, they sell head nets uh, that are essentially attached to a, uh, to a, uh, a hat and, uh, and you can keep them off your face and then, then long sleeves and gloves will protect you because unlike mosquitoes, buffalo gnats do not bite through clothing. Ooh. So would it be too early for pirate bugs? Uh, not, not too early for pirate bugs. Always associate pirate, you'll love this one, always associate pirate bugs pirate? with when peonies bloom. <laughs> and we're a little bit past that. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's the right time. Usually the pirate bugs are just thick in peonies uh, in, when they bloom. So that's the way I tell when bugs are out is when things are in bloom. So, uh, so idea, that could though. be, and, and these will be a little black and white insect, kind of triangular shaped almost, or diamond shaped more mm -hmm. yes. But they're tiny. Frankly. Yeah, they're like yeah. a 32nd to a 16th of an inch. And, uh, and they give you a little nip, and they're going to be more if you're around flowers or out in the sunshine. Same thing with the buffalo gnats. They like sunshine. They don't like to shade. Okay. Wow. Same things to help kind of protect yourself from them. But uh, your biggest, best bet is to stay away from the flowers a little bit. You could walk around with a tent. <laughs> 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 a tent already placed up. Okay, maybe not that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, don't go away. We have a special Did You Know next. Okay, well, we're going to go to some uh, viewer emails that have been sent in, and we're going to start with you, Jim. Okay, this one says, my tree has mushrooms growing on the trunk. Should I be concerned? Definitely. Uh, in the picture on the, your TV, it shows three different kinds of uh, pruning bodies of decay. Mushrooms are another pruning body of a decay organism, and that means your tree is rotting on the inside. Wood rot fungi only eat what is already dead. They don't eat live tissue. But to get a fruiting body on the outside, it not only means that they're attacking the inner wood of the tree, but the sapwood has died, the cambium has died, and so has the bark. And that's the only way you get the fruiting body on the outside. The lower down on that tree trunk that is, the more concern you need to be, because the lower down, the more weight is above that decay area. and the greater chance that it will snap and fall down. So you actually need to get an arborist out there and have them check the safety of that tree, especially if it's going to fall in a house, road, uh, or on anybody. So. Wow, good explanation. I never heard it quite that thoroughly. That's really good. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. And now, Sandy. Yeah, we actually we have a, a question from a viewer had a, uh, about ivy vines. They have a problem with ivy vines cre creeping into the lawn, be it their long and very sturdy runners. There's a good way to get rid of ivy. And I assume the overall ivy, they must be wanting to keep English ivy mm -hmm. or something along those lines, maybe. Uh, and so it's really going to be very hard if you're really trying to keep the plant. So. Uh, I think what I would probably do with those, rather than just cutting them off there, right where they start to go into the lawn, if you can sort of pull them back, so to, as it grows out, just grab it and then pull it all the way back until you see kind of where it's coming from, and then maybe cut it way back, um, and then hopefully then those that are starting to come out on the lawn, maybe at least it would buy you a little bit more time. So don't just cut it right where it starts in the lawn. There really isn't anything much beyond that that I can think of um, to take care of that. So really follow them all the way back and remove them at that point. The other question they have, which I thought was great, is there any good trick to removing cockleburrs from one's clothing after working among them outside? They stick to everything. That's the whole idea of cockleburrs, mm -hmm. right? They're it's like nature's on. Velcro, That's how right? They get around. So, Phil, I think you had an interesting comment about what to do with your clothing with cockleburrs. <laughs> you had toss it. Just throw the clothing away. Just sort of forget that. And then I think Jim and Diane, you were saying that you're more you had, practical. 
you're much more practical, <laughs> right? Just to sort of remove them as you can, you know, and that can individually, be a bother. which yeah. really is a problem. So I guess my suggestion might be really watch what clothing you wear mm -hmm. when you're out there. Um, if you can, if it's not too hot, actually canvas works really well. I have a canvas yes. kind of shirt or something like that where, and, and then they don't stick. So maybe that's, a, or even, you know, some nylons and some of those things maybe you can wear that, that don't stick. So that might be <laughs> the long run. Otherwise, throw them away. Buy new clothing. Buy new canvas ones. Buy new canvas ones. We yeah, recently that's inherited tough. a new dog that came in with about a hundred of those cockamers. on it. Right. So, uh, You're wow. not throwing the dog wow. away. No, we didn't throw the dog away. But <laughs> <laughs> it was a matter of uh, okay. cold scissors. Wow. And, uh, I had to double yeah. check on this. Yeah, no, yeah. we didn't Just do that. Checking. Okay, very Just good. Checking. So that well, is a tough one. Maybe other people have Well, ideas. with that comment, let's go right to your, <laughs> your email. Thank you, Sandy, but go ahead, Phil. <laughs> I have a viewer question who wants to know how to get rid of scales. And scale insects are <coughs> sucking pests that will uh, that will feed on the sap of the plant. Uh, if you s the pictures that are being shown are cottony, cushiony scale that are only found in <coughs> California. But, but at any rate, uh, uh, they are uh, you know you find what you can on the internet. But uh, so if you see things that have a lot of white on them like that, those are probably mealy bugs, not scale. Uh, but uh, you control them either way, and if they're on house plants. Uh, way I like to do it because I'm the lazy fair type of guy. Uh, I move my house plants outside, and there are all kinds mm -hmm. of predatory and parasitic insects that just attack those things and chow them down. And by the time I bring them in the fall, there's very few left. And then by the time you get to February, you start to notice them, but you kind of put up with it till May when you move them <laughs> back out. Not a big deal. Uh, if you want to hit them better, particularly on house plants, once a week sprays of insecticidal soap will control both scale and uh, mealybug. Here's a kicker. You're going to have to do it for about 12 to 16 weeks straight, and if you miss a week, you start all over. So, uh, hand pick them off, spray them. Uh, insecticidal soap works well. Very good, very thorough. Uh, they did ask whether kale and clay would work. Kale and clay is something that just makes things slimy and slick. Probably would not work very well against uh, scale insects. Okay, all righty, thank you. Are you ready for tonight for tonight's quiz? Let's go to that right now. Agraria. We were all, we all knew the genus. We weren't sure of the other part of the name. Okay, let's go to the phone lines and we'll start with line five and it's on grapes. Hello there. Hello. Yes, what's I your question? I have a question about my three-year-old grapes. Okay. The, they have insects of some sort. I can't see them, but this is the second year in a row that they have eaten the little grapes before they even got a real good start. And this year, I vowed I was going to kill them. So I used seven once, and then the next time, two weeks, I would use a fungicide, insecticide, multicide. And then the next two weeks, I would use seven again, alternate. And still, no grapes this year. Yeah, I'm not familiar with anything that's going to bother the grapes when they're real small. Um, I would lean towards, I don't know what would be possibly the reason for the, for losing real tiny grapes. Um, I don't about, know of any bugs. Yeah, I wouldn't wonder about disease issues, I was thinking especially about, this year. I was wondering about Motritis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Motritis does attack uh, grapefruit, <coughs> turn it brown, they'll shrivel up and fall off. And then I was wondering, Phil, uh, what about birds eating the little ones? Uh, the birds are going to be more interested in when they get bigger. You okay. know, robins mm -hmm. and other fruit-eating birds will go after them, but I wouldn't expect them when they're itty-bitty little tiny hard green things like uh, the little ones are. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. don't know. Well, we've, we've and the Titus likes moisture, yeah. and we've had two moist springs. Yes, we've had the gr it, this spring has been very nice for Botrytis. <laughs> they just kind very of nice. very nice. Just like death and destruction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they really kind of shrivel up. So yeah. it's not so much that anything's eating them. They just kind of yeah. shrivel up. And, and, and right, and they shrivel up and they tend to fall off. Too. Then they fall off once mm -hmm. they kind of shrivel and fall off. So they might look like. So meat what meat. can she do? I mean, well, she mentioned a fungicide. She needs to use that more regularly instead of the insecticide. Okay. And the fungicide would have to be put on by every 10 to 14 days okay. during the rainy time. Now we've been dry for 10 days, so. Um, 
But if it starts raining, can you? Oh, I can also forget. If it gets heavy dews, that's good and wet enough for the botrytis too. So, whether it's rain or dews, if it starts getting that, then you need to go back to a 10-day to two-week uh, regime on the fungicides. And okay. maybe even starting earlier. Right. I'm not sure exactly when she. It sounded like maybe later on she did the fungicide. And then when do you stop it? How many days after? Well, uh, botrytis will attack the grapes right up to harvest. Oh wow. So she'd have to read the label to make sure she stops when the Well, most lines are cut off two weeks before the harvest okay. time. So there still could be something that's getting yeah, them. Provided she's got grapes left and worth well, more. Wow. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, gosh, we're real cheery. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Japanese beetles will get them anyway. Yeah, so. oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> but it's, it tastes so good. You really want to have them. Yeah. So we're leaning towards fungicide then. So don't alternate with insecticide. Wow, the time goes fast, and we enjoyed ourselves so much, even though some of the stories were sad. We want to thank you for watching, and have a great week gardening. Bye-bye.